Spring and former U.S. Ambassador to Russia, now Director of the Institute for International Studies at Stanford, and an NBC News International Affairs Analyst, Michael McFall. Ambassador McFall, thanks for being with us this morning. You spoke so powerfully the other morning when we were on together when the news had just broken about the death of your friend Alexei Navalny. Uh, from We approached that story with, I think, appropriate skepticism of the official version of events. We're hearing more that uh, probably confirms some of your suspicions. What more have you heard? What more do you know about the death of Navalny now a few days later? Well, you just did a great job, Willie, and your team of reporting it. Those are exactly the leads that his family and his friends and his members of his group are, are pursuing. Uh, as I said on your program, uh, let's be crystal clear. We don't need an autopsy to know that Putin killed Navalny. It doesn't matter how. We don't need to know the exact facts. Uh, he tried to poison him and kill him before. He left, went to Germany, got better, went back. Putin immediately arrested him and has been torturing him ever since. Slowly, over the years, his conditions were getting worse and worse and worse. The last stop in his tragic life in prison was this horrific jail uh, that he was living in. I, I saw his wife, Yulia, the night before he died, and she described in vivid detail the conditions under which he was trying to keep alive. So we need to know the facts if we can, and I'm glad people are pushing to do that. But there's no ambiguity here. Uh, Putin killed Navalny, and as his wife said very dramatically at the Munich Security Conference that I was at, he needs to be held accountable for his crimes. Mr. Ambassador, what do you hope that accountability is, and what do you hope the administration's response will be? Well, in the long run, I want him to go to prison and face the consequences, uh, just like his wife does, just like his family does and his colleagues. That's a long-term proposition, right? Uh, in the short term, it's very clear what, need, what can happen if it, and it's really not the administration, it's Republican members of Congress. And, and I want to underscore, I'm a, remember, I'm a political science professor here at Stanford. I teach about uh, history and democratic breakthroughs and revolution and failed democratic breakthroughs. And what's really clear to me when I study this history is you don't get many chances to be on the right side of history and do the right thing. Right. Most of government life is grinding away incremental stuff and failure. Right now, Speaker Johnson has the ability to make history and to do the right thing. Uh, when they come back from their holiday, if they put the bill on the floor for 60 billion new dollars in aid for Ukraine, that is a would be a direct response to the assassination of Alexei Navalny. Conversely, sitting on that, blocking it, is a gift to Vladimir Putin. Think about it. You want to be an American today, gifting Vladimir Putin in the wake of this assassination? And by the way, I met with many soldiers from Ukraine at this conference, uh, government officials from Ukraine. He's killing innocent Ukrainians every day. So they don't even have to invent anything. They don't even have to draft a right. law. It, the bill is ready for them. They have the opportunity to do the right thing. And I guarantee you they'll feel better about doing that uh, if they do it. And they'll feel remorse if they don't, despite whatever happens with Mr. Trump. And it, it, Mr. Ambassador, um, following up on what you're saying, uh, this isn't just any vote. This is a vote that will hang over them for the rest of their lives, that will hang over them in death. Yeah. 84 years later, we remember what FDR did uh, to keep uh, keep Britain uh, flo uh, afloat against Hitler. We remember 84 years later what Charles Lindbergh, a man who would have been praised uh, uh, throughout history as, as, as a, a great adventurer, a great aviator. But instead, we remember 84 years later, Charles Lindbergh's speech talking about how Britain could not win that the American firsters understood we should not help Britain against Hitler. And, and you look at this and, and you can see, and, and more and more conservatives, well, real conservatives, are coming out. Here's uh, Jerry Baker, uh, who is the editor-at-large for the Wall Street Journal editorial page. And he talks about the moral blindness of Putin's apologists. And he brings up Newt Gingrich, who compared 
Joe Biden to Vladimir Putin and the killing of Navalny. And, and so uh, Baker writes this. Need I say this? Mr. Biden isn't Vladimir Putin. Mr. Biden doesn't invade neighbors on a false pretext, killing indiscriminately. He doesn't favor people who have fallen into disfavor. He doesn't have people fall from windows in tall buildings. He doesn't throw a foreign journalist in jail for reporting the truth about what's going on in his country. He doesn't arrange the murder of his domestic political opponents on the soil of other countries. And he doesn't imprison, torture, or preside over death by sudden death of his principal domestic critics. If you can't see the difference, then I say respectfully that you have lost or discarded your capacity for moral reasoning. And that is even a bigger problem. And it, it's happening with people like Newt Gingrich. It's happening with people on other cable networks. It's happening with Mike Johnson. And of course, it's been happening with Donald Trump for a long time. I mean, what, how... How huge are the stakes in this fight, not just for Ukraine, but for the future of our democracy? Well, Joe, I could not agree with you more about thinking about the 1930s and Lindbergh. Uh, in fact, on my desk right now, you show some uh, reading materials. Let me show some. This is a fantastic book about that period. It's by Bob Kagan. It's called The Ghost at the Feast. America and the Collapse of World Order, 1900 and 1941. He documents exactly that. And then one more book, I'm sorry, but this is a fantastic book by your colleague, Rachel Maddow, called Prequel. And if you read that history from the 1930s, thank you for invoking it. It, it feels like a deja vu. And we <laughs> should learn, and Speaker Johnson should read this history so that he doesn't become the next Charles Lindbergh of this historical moment. And I get it. I was with members of Congress. You know these people better than I do, but I was with them in Munich from the Republican Party. I get the pressure they're under with Mr. Trump. I know when I talk to them, they agree with me, Joe. They tell me at dinner they agree with me. They're just afraid of Mr. Trump. And my message to them is you don't get to be in a moment of history very often. They're in a moment of history, and they will be remembered for doing the wrong thing for 84 years, just like you said, if they do it. And the other thing I would say, I'm not an expert on American electoral politics, you are, but it doesn't seem like Speaker Johnson's going to have that much time left. Uh, no. if, he, if he's voted out of office because the, he brings this bill to the floor, or if he's voted out come November... He doesn't get many opportunities to make his mark in history. This is his mark. And, and, and I get, I just, the, the sense of urgency I heard from Ukrainians in Munich, that they are dying, that they have no ammunition. And if they don't vote this in, and Putin's army is rolling over them at even a greater speed come November, is that really a place you want to be in the history books? I just really hope they do the right thing. The moment is now to do that.